Now, it's fair to say there's division amongst Jack and Daxter fans. Some people like that first game more than the others, some people prefer the sequels, but I think we can all agree that if you don't like Jack X, I'm afraid you're just a bit of a lame-o. Sorry it had to be me who had to tell you. Jack X is so much fun. It's probably some of the most immediate, cathartic action Naughty Dog has ever made. So of course I'm going to talk about it, just so I can play it again. I don't like the assumption that after I talk about major entries in a series, that I should then be appointed to the role of spin-off janitor to talk about the kind of games that everyone sort of already knows are either alright or not very good. Games that have to be doing something a little more interesting for me to take note, especially when they're not even made by the original developers anyway. But Jack X, aside from being an excellent game I just want to play through again, wasn't shipped off to another studio. It was made by Naughty Dog and continues on from where the platformer trilogy left off. Surprisingly, doing a pretty good job of following up and building on the characters and world previously presented, if in a unique way. It even ties up a few dangling threads that Jack 3 chose to neglect. But before we can discuss that good shit, I got a bone to pick with Jack X and the fact that <laughs> it's cursed. So apparently Jack X is one of the few PS2 games that has trouble playing on the PS2 Slim model, which I was unaware of before I started recording footage for this video. The game kept trapping me in menus due to some autosave glitch, forcing me to restart the console when it happened, and eventually after beating a fourth of the game, it chose to stop recognizing my save file on boot up altogether. In fact, at that point, it just chose to stop interacting with the memory card at all. So theoretically, to reach that save now, I would have to play on an original fat PS2. And I do have one of those, it, just for some reason it's uh, not really working anymore. So instead, I restarted the entire game without a memory card inserted and did it all in one sitting to get footage for this review. Which actually sped things up, because without a memory card, the game won't freeze on that autosave glitch, because... I can't autosave now. And this would be bad enough, but this isn't even mentioning that this is my second copy of Jack X we're working with. The original I got when the game came out started glitching up and freezing after a year or so, so I had to replace it. So I have no idea how good the PS4 port of Jack X is because I am not buying this game a third time. B but anyway, other than that, Jack X does have some pretty impressive options for a PS2 game. PAL copies have a 60Hz switch, there's progressive scan, and a proper 16x9 mode that actually shows more of the screen and doesn't just zoom it in like past jacks. Calling it proper widescreen is still perhaps a bit misleading, it's not actually making the resolution higher or anything. It uses something called anamorphic widescreen, where it creates a squished 16x9 perspective at 4x3 and then just stretches it out. Ultimately, you're still getting about 640x480. It's an illusion. This is the kind of widescreen Wii games use. If you record a Wii at 16x9 through capture software that doesn't account for the anamorphic trickery, you get what the games actually look like, which is this. This is what the games are actually outputting as before the console stretches them. Yeah, bet you wish you didn't know that now, huh? Anyway, how's this whole combat racing stuff then? Jack X revolves around two main mechanics, boosting and blasting. Boosting is achieved by grabbing items and hitting pads, but you can gain considerably more boost by achieving high airtime and power sliding. Naughty Dog, of course, are no strangers to some good old-fashioned boost racing. Jack X is like Crash Team Racing, but with Edge. No, seriously, he's in the game. Boosting is, of course, risk-reward. You want to take those corners with speed and grace, but while keeping control of your car so you don't spin off like a tit. The faster you're going, the more sensitive things get. <laughs> You don't want to be taking those corners too late or too early. Combat isn't that deep or anything here. If you got a yellow offensive weapon, you shoot it at the guy in front. If you have a red defensive item, you shoot it out the back to cause chaos or to deflect an incoming projectile. The depth really comes from your ability to prioritize what pickups to go for during a race in the heat of the moment. 
Items on the track are separated into four kinds. Health items to restore your vehicle, boost pickups to add to your boost gauge, offensive items, and defensive items. This creates a little more strategy than your average cartoon racer with randomized question mark pickups. In those games, the question is to go for the item box or not to go for the item box. It's up in the air whether you'll get a weapon or a speed boost. There are, of course, some other factors to consider. A lot of weapons in, say, Double Dash do double duty as either offensive or or defensive, adding versatility to a given weapon but taking away precious decision making out of the player's hands when it comes to picking the thing up. One item box is potentially just as useful as another, there's not much thinking about which to get, just get the easiest to reach without slowing your forward momentum. Here it's up to you to make the choice of what you think you need the most in the heat of the action. Concerned with staving off attacks? Then go for the red defensive item, or maybe you just want to keep your distance and boost is where it's at. What's more important, dealing damage immediately to to the car in front of you or healing your ride. At least Double Dash introduced to the on-the-fly option to pick between item or two item. Not a huge choice, but I'll give it some credit. Sure, there are a few different weapons that get randomized upon pickup, but you'll always know if they'll be defensive or offensive beforehand based on their color. It's also worth noting that the weapon you'll get in this randomization does vary depending on your position in the race. Having boosts be their own items, though, takes them out of this randomization rubber banding. You can still pick up boost pickups in first place, something the Mario Karts discourage. At least you never feel like your ability to go fast is being reduced because you're doing too well. Putting the choice of what type of item to pick up in the player's hands, I think, really adds to the depth of this racer. And of course, if you got what it takes, you may want to take a chance at getting two items at once. Damn. Which may take a little more effort than getting the double question mark box. Sorry, I don't mean to be dunking on Mario Kart here or anything. I like Double Dash. It's just that when I start a comparison, it doesn't seem to end for like five minutes. Game design alert. Making these choices on the fly while keeping your speed up with boost tricks creates an energetic and rewarding loop as you try and maintain speed while fending off foes. Trying to estimate what the most pressing pickup your car needs to stay ahead of the competition is, and whether it will come at the cost of speed or the integrity of your ride. That all said, of course, this is a combat racer where inherently there's going to be times where no matter how far ahead you are, how perfectly you're making each turn and getting ahead of the competition. At some point, the randomizer gods are going to give the guy behind you some mega ultra beam of death that's going to blow you up. Sometimes, no matter what you do, it seems unavoidable that you're going to get blown up at least once or twice per race, and it's hard to really say how to get around that in this kind of crazy action racer type game. But I think at the bare minimum, these ultra weapons that get given to stragglers that just decimate everything in front of them seem like they don't really need to be here. They can undermine the satisfaction of performing at your best, when it seems like no matter how efficient you're being, and no matter if you win the race by a mile, you still have to witness yourself getting torn to shreds at least once, even in an otherwise successful race. If I'm performing at my best and doing really well at the game, I think it should be easier to beat a race without seeing my car explode. I think I only got to experience that like once in my entire eight hour playthrough. The great thing about Jack X is that in that little meaty six to eight hour story mode, things rarely get too tedious, thanks to the exorbitant amount of modes the game throws at you. Outside of the Grand Prix Cups that have you performing three back-to-back -back races, you're unlikely to need to do the same type of event more than once in a row. You have traditional races, time trials with pickups that freeze the clock, arena battles, creature hunting challenges, item hunt challenges, special death races of different types, even a uh, capture the flag mode makes a uh, admittedly somewhat awkward appearance in the single player. What's great is only a few races absolutely require you to come first place to progress. Sure, you're gonna have to come first a lot to beat the game, but you can select from a lot of events at the same time, so the odd one giving you trouble might not need to be completely mastered. You may be able to skimp a bit on a mission you don't like too much as long as you have enough points across all missions to unlock the next Grand Prix bottleneck, since you can still earn points for coming 
third or second. You need 50 points to enter the Grand Prix for each of the four cups, but there's up to 60 points up for grabs in each Grand Prix bracket, giving you a few points worth of leeway. This works great for a game with so much variety where you may not be totally feeling a given type of event. I kind of wish I had mentioned this game in my video about Naughty Dog and non-linearity now, because what you get here is a title that a lot of the time does give you quite a bit of freedom when it comes to picking from a number of events in any order you prefer. The game's story gets away with this, taking place mostly off the track and at the Grand Prix bottlenecks. Before I discuss that story though, just a few words on presentation. Performance is pretty good, and while the game doesn't look quite as polished as the more intimate Jack 2 got to be, there's a few bland tracks here and there. Most of them are detailed and crisp enough to look at least especially nice when you're speeding past them. That sounded more backhanded than it was meant to be. Environments and models, they're good. High quality, late PS2 stuff. Cutscenes are pre-rendered though, unlike in the trilogy, which probably helped Naughty Dog fill them with more assets, but the inherent compression has made them age a lot worse than the clean and crisp look of the cutscenes in the other games. Of course, a bit of compression can't ruin one of the raddest opening cutscenes ever. Dex, get in the car! Jack! Are you crazy? You ruined my story! One of my favorite parts of this title's presentation, though, is that Jack finally has bangers! Oh! This game has a pretty epic rock soundtrack that does an immensely good job adding to the adrenaline pumping thrills of the high speed racing. The track Steel and its various iterations, like Crash and Burn, being particularly memorable. There's even a track with woes in it. So some certified lads tunes up in here. What makes Jack X pretty special is that on top of being some of the most fun you can have in a non-sim racer, Naughty Dog didn't skimp on a cool little story for Jack fans to get hooked into as well. Jack X takes place after Jack 3 and sees Jack and the gang invited to the reading of Crime Boss Crew's will. The big gang lord? Yeah! Big is right! He invites his closest associates, which thankfully for us are, are characters we already knew, and his daughter Rain. What follows is, I think, a pretty cool setup. It's an excuse to posthumously bring back the excellent crew, and he is an appropriate catalyst for this game's events, which are going to concern themselves much more with the crime underbelly aspects of the Jack universe, and less with the fantasy, political, and world-ending cataclysm elements of Jack. Jack and the gang are poisoned by Crew and forced to win the Crass City Grand Prix in exchange for the antidote. Crew wanting to one-up the major crime syndicate in Crass City run by the mysterious Mizo, who, becoming apparent as the game transpires, is intimidating competitors through his vast criminal powers to fix races and have complete control of the sport, making Jack and friends his only real opposition since they have no choice but to race for their lives. Which is cool, makes our plucky heroes irreverent underdogs in this new seedy world. Are you crazy? The world's deadliest crime lord is offering you a deal and you refuse? What does crew have on you guys? This is amazing, folks! If you're listening, Mizo, your days are numbered. We'll win, or we'll die trying. Partially when I was younger, I was somewhat wondering why Crass City hadn't been mentioned in the series till now. Nobody lives outside Haven's walls. Not a whole city. I suppose it's not inconceivable there were other cities this whole time. The Jack Trilogy's loosey-goosey, light-on-details world-building, especially come the third game, leaves basically any avenue open for follow-ups. But still, it was kind of like, okay, well, what were these guys doing when we were all saving the world? Racing, I guess? While Jack 2 and 3 presented us with a bit of disparity between how Jack was presented heroically in cutscenes and the level of carnage he could perform in gameplay, in Jack X, the discrepancies between how the story plays out in the cutscenes versus the gameplay are so big, I don't think you need me to point them out for you. Jack and buddies are all good pals in the cinemas, but get on the track and anybody is fair game. Almost makes you wonder if they could have made the wipeouts a little less 
unsurvivable to accommodate the story, but I imagine having super sick wipeouts superseded the need for consistency between cutscene and gameplay. Even menus, though, have trouble staying in line with the cutscenes. Sig's return in the cutscenes is undercut by him describing a mission to you before his first appearance. Hello, Cherries! You about to experience my kind of drive. Most fools haven't figured me into the mix. Sig! Yeah. Thanks for no! joining the team, Sig! And I think Cleaver should stop talking so much shit. If you turn your back on this track, it'll bite you where the shade is. Have a go at it, and we'll see if you're man enough to race against me. After I owned him so hard in the Grand Prix, he positioned himself as Jack's main rival in. Wow, Jack has beaten Cleaver! What a stunning upset! I was also looking forward to seeing that teased Cleaver and Vega duo, but I guess that got walked back. If you can put to one side the whiplash in context between cutscene and gameplay, though, this is quite a fun Jack story that actually attempts to reflect on past games a little and develop the cast, albeit in a weirdly subversive way at times, which I'll soon get to. First off, Kira is properly back and paired with Jack again, seemingly admitting the sudden Ashlyn focus in 3 was a misstep and finally paying off their coupling since the start of the series. Jack! Hey! Will you kiss her already? Sheesh! Oh yeah, that's what I call a photo finish. The fact they didn't do that in 3 is still weirdly baffling to me. She even gets a little arc here about how she wants to race, but Samos won't let her, and at least it's something for her to do, though. A woman's place is in the garage fixing cars. Girls shouldn't be allowed to do the dangerous thing feels like a pretty played out plotline even for 2005. Anyway, ultimately it's a positive story if a bit generic. Daddy, I'm racing and that's final. Ah yeah, she's got her independence now. Ooh. Thanks for joining the team, Kira. Jack's story is where the interesting stuff is though. This game actually tries to question some of Jack's prior actions and his tendency to leave a trail of corpses throughout his so-called heroic adventures. Yours truly has recovered documents that prove Jack was the cause of Crew's death. What? Jack left him to die in a terrible explosion. How heartless can you get? It wasn't like that. No, no I think we can pretty much say it was a, a lot like that. Jack ain't out here making sure due process takes place or anything. So will Jack grow from being challenged like this? In the greatest video game one-liner since System Shock 2's Nah, we get our answer. You have a habit of leaving people to die, don't you? You get used to it. <laughs> no. I gotta almost respect this direction, it's so brazen. Jack X finally gives us some actual inner conflict for the Jack series to chew on after a bunch of games alluding to some but never actually following through and exploring any of it. And right when you think Jack X is gonna present some meaningful change, it just goes, Sight! I just kinda gotta respect it. Did they realize the previous games were lacking a bit in character development and then just decided to say, yeah, we did that on purpose. Go to hell. Whatever the intention was, it keeps with the edgy vibe of the later Jack games. It asks a more interesting question than those games did, I think, and follows through on it by going, does it really matter though? You know, I think it's more honest to present an inner conflict for Jack, and again, a better one, I think, than what we've seen before, and have the result be no change and just continued resilient self-belief, rather than just saying he changed at game's end and not really feeling us in on why. This place is worth fighting for. I like the admission that Jack X makes that maybe we can do more with these characters and we can re-examine their actions, but we're not gonna bend them into something they're not at the end of it all and have them change who they are at this point. Have them wallowing in self-doubt till they don't resemble themselves. It has us ask some questions about Jack, but then kind of stays true to the series and the character by going, yeah, but really, who gives a shit? Because yeah, confronting your mistakes but ultimately deciding not to change is still a valid direction, a valid endpoint. Maybe we can acknowledge mistakes of the past but remain resilient. To accomplish your goals, sometimes you do questionable things, you make bad choices, and people goad you about your regrets on the way. But that doesn't stop you from moving forward, because at the end of the day, I guess you... Get used to it. 